Hello, I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro, and I'm a past president of the North American Menopause Society. Joining me today is someone that's well known to NAMS, Dr. Stephanie Fobian, who is a professor and chair of the Department of Medicine at Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. She's also director of the Mayo Clinic Center for Women's Health and medical director, of course, of the North American Menopause Society. Today, we're going to be talking about genitourinary syndrome of menopause, and we really want to focus on this for our healthcare providers. Stephanie, first talk to our providers about why it's so important for our providers to be screening and educating all peri- and postmenopausal women about what this syndrome means to them. Well, I, that's such a, a, a great question and an important topic. I, I think the problem here um, is that women are not always aware that these symptoms of vaginal dryness and discomfort with sex and difficulty with urination actually relate to menopause. And so women often will not bring it up with their providers and providers don't always ask questions that they need to, to make sure that they're covering symptoms that women have that they may not be reporting. So I think part of this is education uh, that, that women need about their bodies, about what's happening when uh, they lose estrogen around menopause and that these symptoms actually are tied to menopause. And two, that there are things that they can do about the symptoms. Uh, and both of those are just critical pieces and, and not well covered, I think, by most providers at this time. I think it's such a good point because often it starts well into the menopause and women think, oh, this is something that has to do with aging and don't recognize the link with estrogen and the fact that this may get progressively worse. So let's first talk about the non-hormonal options that are available for the management of GSM because I think as healthcare providers, we often don't put that on the table for our patients. I agree. Um, there are lots of non-hormonal options and it's important to add that these non-hormonal options can be used alone or they can even be used with the prescription therapies that we have available to us. So either way, providers need to be talking about these options. But the first would be lubricants. So lubricants are used as needed for sexual activity. And the other major category is moisturizers. And moisturizers are used on a more regular basis to help maintain vulvar and vaginal moisture um, on an ongoing basis. So it doesn't mean that a woman has to be sexually active to be using these moisturizers. Those can be for everyone. And that's for general comfort. I often tell my patients that's sort of like face cream for the vagina, but it's one of those things where you use it on a regular basis. It's maintenance. Um, but the lubricants are, are used for sexual activity. Those come in several different categories. There are water-based lubricants, there are silicone-based lubricants, and, and there are natural oils, of course, but we typically don't use those as much um, for a number of reasons. And pre-menopausally, we worried about uh, compromising condoms because oils could do that. Not so much post-menopause, but um, oils can still be problematic in that they stain things. So, most of the time we do recommend either these lubricants that are water-based or silicone-based. So let's talk about moving on to women who find that that isn't enough and come in to talk about what their therapeutic prescriptive options are. So there are many of them uh, and we are fortunate these days to have lots of options. There are low-dose estrogen products that are available in many different forms including creams, tablets that are inserted vaginally, vaginal inserts, uh, there's a vaginal ring, there's vaginal DHEA that is a pro-hormone uh, that is also used as a vaginal insert. And then there's even an oral medication uh, called oscemaphine that's taken on a daily basis. So we have so many options available to women. All are efficacious. We know they all work. It's just really comes down to a matter of personal preference and what women feel like they uh, can take and also actually cost. Um, and insurance coverage, which can be a problem for some of these. And a word to our healthcare providers who have women on a low dose formulation systemically for hot flashes and night sweats, and the adjunctive use of this of women complain that they still have dryness. A word on safety about that. So that is a really important point. We are using very low doses of systemic estrogen for hot flashes and night sweats, and sometimes that's enough to cover these vaginal symptoms, but sometimes it's really not quite enough to cover them. And so it is okay to go ahead and use a low dose vaginal estrogen or DHEA product in addition to a systemic estrogen product. You probably wouldn't want to use the astemaphine, so a serum in addition to estrogen, 
Um, but the other topical low dose uh, hormonal products are just fine to use with low dose systemic estrogen therapy. And then of course, the black box warning. So if you're taking something systemic or you're taking something low dose, I see you looking off to the side and rolling your eyes as am I. But you know, we have such an issue with a black box warning. And what should a healthcare prescriber say to a patient in anticipation of them going home, reading the black box warning and going, oh my goodness, I'm not taking this. Well, I, th I think um, I, what you just said was important is education and that we, um, uh, that we advise our patients ahead of time that this is going to happen. So they go to the pharmacy, they get the prescription, they take out the package insert that is, you know, pages long, and they see the black box warning and it's scary. It says this product causes breast cancer and is associated with stroke and may cause dementia. And I mean, who would take anything that had that on there? So I think the key is, uh, is really educating our patients that this is going to happen. Um, that these warnings, there is no evidence uh, that, that these bad things, uh, adverse events can happen with low dose estrogen. We have plenty of observational data that show that uh, low dose vaginal estrogen is safe over time and is not associated with any of these bad outcomes. Um, so I think that's important for our patients to hear from us that this will, you will see it. There will be a black box warning um, there is no evidence to support that these outcomes are associated with this product uh, and that it should be safe for you to use. So before I let you go, for women who don't want to take even low-dose estrogen and are now turning to energy-based therapies, which you can get not only in your physician's office, but you can get them in very many unregulated places in terms of a medical uh, physician or a medical facility. Can you bring us up to speed where we stand and what our position is when it comes to these laser-based therapies? Right. So, so several laser therapies are in development. And I, I think, you know, there is some promising data, initial data on these, uh, these treatment devices. And I think we just need a, a little bit of caution here. Um, we need some additional data. We need longer-term studies. Um, sham controlled, we need more safety data. So what we don't have um, is the longer term safety and efficacy data. And we really need to have that before we can wholesale recommend this as a standard therapy. But no doubt uh, there, there are some promising initial data associated with these, uh, with these devices. Now, many, they're not covered by insurance, so they're extraordinarily expensive. And I think just a word of caution is needed for our patients. Okay, thank you so much for joining me today and reviewing this on behalf of all of our healthcare practitioners. It's been a great session. Bye for now. Thank you so much.